Okay, I think, um, <laughs> luckily I have a very simple job because the connection between these papers is extremely clear. <laughs> I actually did have in mind something that does connect these papers, but, but maybe, maybe I'll try it for just a minute and a quarter or something like that just to get things started. I thought, actually, the connection is that each one of these three uh, is right at the edge of what we'd still want to be considering as art historical practices in different, in completely different ways. But since the, since, since the, since what you guys just did is just on our mind, I'll just say about this first. I thought and was making a, um, I was doing a little uh, list of um, things that I thought actually pertained extremely well, like you know, transparently well to art history and, and just perfect matches. One of them is the idea that you were doing toward the end about planets that can be demoted and you know the canon and all the rest of that. What canon can't be called something important or worth observing or does it count and all the rest of that. And then at the beginning, there was that idea of um, theoretical speculations, and we're all, you know, we're great at that. We're great at going on and on, astrophysicists, physicists, art historians, and making all kinds of speculations that will wait for later validation. Um, third, there was the notion of things that can't be observed, which is an um, ongoing subject of interest in a lot of art history and theory, and uh, Whitney Davis, whose name has come up, is particularly interested in this, that the objects of art history might also be things that can't be observed. And then, of course, in the whole middle section of um, what happens when everything folds in and the body is inside and then you're inside and then the subject and the object um, are, 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 are convoluted one with the other, also something that attracts a huge amount of attention. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm, pitilessly, um, I'm pitilessly abstracting and, and making a kind of instrumentalist reading of it, but it does raise the question with the metaphor of where the metaphor actually stops applying. Because it does seem to me like it would have to stop somewhere Otherwise, astronomy is not going to work, or art history is not going to work, and something. So that would be my way of putting it in, in that case. Um, and just um, quickly about, um, about um, Isabel, um, I would be very interested to know in that respect, in, re in respect to the same theme, about when you cross some sort of boundary to a place where you don't want to really think of yourself for these purposes as doing art history or thinking about art history, I'd be interested to know more about what you think about Stan, Stan Abe's intervention there, because he's, the way I read that is he's, he's a very committed um, to a kind of um, institutional, Foucauldian, generally speaking, post-colonial uh, approach to this material, where you do reconfigure transculturality to the point where you are saying, well, any transcultural motion, any transcultural move is a move which, which validates a certain politics or a certain nationality and so on. But once, you've, once you occupy the Stan Abe position, right, then where are you in relation to transculturality and these other things? So it's also, a, to me, an analogous point. Probably only to me, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then in relation to Kirsten's uh, paper also briefly, I mean, would be very interested to hear like from, from everybody about the Kubler revival, which I think is really, um, it's in the air. Um, it's, it's not just, of course, David Summers and, and, and Whitney Davis and so on, but it, it come, came up in my seminar here two days ago. It's, it's everywhere. The conditions of the Kubler revival, though, are, are odd because um, if practices that we might collectively want to continue to call art history for certain reasons um, would, would want to take on board the Kubler um, project, they might become unrecognizable to themselves. It's an analogous issue that, to me, is raised by other people of very different sorts, like George D. D. Ubermann. If that, that's a very challenging project, which might, uh, if it were really actually imported, would do something extremely odd and unexpected and probably unwanted um, in, into, in, the, in the very inside of various senses of chronology and time and so on. So again, there's a moment where, in your reading, a certain post-colonial theory reception comes together in, in a certain uh, German scholarly context coming out of a translation with a preface by Gottfried Böhm. It's a very particular sort of constellation. Um, but then there's also a, a sense, for me, there's a sense that at the end, that you don't want to go all the way to the end of that road because then you'd be somewhere outside what you'd be, what caused you to be interested to begin with, your disciplinary affiliation. So I should stop. This is my, that's my, that's my bridging stuff. I think we have like 25 minutes, so. Okay. Anyone want to respond to that here? Or? 
Oh, I wanted to ask a question. Should I hold it until after? The, um, the question I have, my name is Michael Schreffler. Thank you all for your papers and presentations. I enjoyed it very much. Um, the question I have is not for anyone in particular, maybe it's for everyone, but it's a question that came to mind through Kirsten Schankweiler's uh, paper on George Kubler. If we're thinking about today um, writing art history in the wake of the global turn, then that means that there's a moment that's called the global turn. And my question is, when was that moment? I thought that um, this morning in Aruna's paper, uh, you linked that moment to post-colonialism and Said and Orientalism, and you said 1977. In Kirsten's, in Kirsten's paper, it was, um, I mean, I don't know, do you see Kubler as the beginning of a global turn? I think you cited some earlier scholars, so has there, have we always been in the global turn? I'm just, I'm wondering how this works in terms of time. Difficult question. I mean, uh, Isabel talked about earlier forms of globalization, so I think, um, yeah, they are different periods of globalization. And German historian called uh, Jürgen Osterhammel, he tried to um, uh, he tried to set up uh, a history of globalization with very early periods and then coming to like colonization as a very early period or even, I mean, um, slave trade and then the contemporary globalization. Mm, I don't know. In terms of contemporary art or global art, it's often re uh, referred to the 1989 um, exhibition Magicien de la Terre that was the first exhibition that introduced artists from around the world with their names and as contemporary art. Um, I mean, it was also criticized a lot, but still I think it's an it's a important turning point for a global contemporary art practice. When we uh, got the uh, invitation, it was the turn aspect of it was more interesting. Because in turn, there is a moving away from uh, to something. I think wh what I think the present is the moving away from is very marked. There is some kind of sense of what you're moving away from, which I would say there's a specificity at this point. And I think the last decade, you can sense the specificity, at least in contemporary art uh, curatorial practice. But about, say, in cinema history, this global turn, uh, cinema history always welcomed cinema from all over the world. And Venice Biennale had more, to, if you look at his own history of film, it has always had filmmakers from all over the world getting in the, uh, in the Venice Film Festival. So in cinema, always the global turn was much before, in a sense. They had to accept a different body of uh, work as part of the way the cinema was growing. So I think in art, it came delayed, but there is the definitely a turn away from something. And I think in our own inquiet way, we all somewhere know that turn away very, between us, we seem to know that turn away. It is not yet very clearly uh, demarcated or brought into some distinction, but that, I think that movement we can mark. Like, I would read it like that. Well, um, I mean, the advantage of living in a planet that is a globe that turns is that it does turn every day. <laughs> uh, it's been doing that for a very long time. So I think, you know, I mean, it's a question of when is the recognition of the turn occurring? And I think there are different recognitions of the turn that have occurred at different times and different misrecognitions. We could, I mean, this afternoon's panel also could suggest that, you know, Isabel's paper suggests that there was a global turn in practice, at least in the third century BC, at least in a specific location. Um, I'm quite interested in exhibition histories. We know that there was an exhibition of Bauhaus art in Calcutta in 1929 that was organized by Rabindranath Tagore. And it was slammed. People hated that exhibition. And he thought that it was a very important thing that people should see. There's been some writing on this. But it's, 
so I could say that, you know, that, that an international exhibition, of, exhibition practice of contemporary art, a self-conscious international e exhibition of contemporary art actually predates Magician de la Terre by uh, several decades in one instance. Uh, everyone's pointed out to Catherine David and, and the Okwi and Mizor documenters. But those may be turns in exhibition and discourse, but I think the networks of practice have always been um, obstinately, um, you know, curious about what's been happening elsewhere. And, and that, that shows in practice. There's a, there's a wonderful um, uh, presentation by, by um, an art historian called Avinam Shalom, who's more uh, a historian of, Orient, uh, of Islamic art, who, who, who presented a, a very interesting paper on the, um, what was it, Mohammedanische Kunst exhibition in, uh, I think it was Hamburg in 1910, uh, Munich, Munich in, in 1910, which um, has Malevich going to see it. And you can see in Malevich's notebooks what's happening in his notebook. And we know about Karl Einstein and his exhibitions, right? So, but there are global turns before the global turns that we are recognizing today. And I think that if we think of a, of a striated, it's interesting to think again of Kubler's proposition of the sequence. These are not chronologies that we have to ask about. Was there an earlier global turn and a later global turn? But was there questions about being global that were asked at very different points of time? That might be an interesting way to think about it. Thank you very much. I'm Kishwar Rizvi. Um, this question is for Rax, uh, and I'd like to use this. Um, I enjoyed very much your presentation, and I think you orchestrated us through so many different modalities, and there's, it's extremely rich. Um, I have two questions that are interrelated. Um, one has to do with this idea of the turn, and um, I thought of it when you said the Arctic turn, and I was, wanted to ask you to speak a little bit about your idea of ecology first of all, in your practice and the way in which you're thinking about your work. Um, because the, although we've talked about time, we haven't really talked about geography today. And I wanted to try and make us think a little bit about locations as well. Um, and in the way in which you showed us from the, cosmo you know, the cosmonauts to the flamingos, this idea of the landscape as one is a very fertile metaphor for you. So could you speak a little bit about both that idea of ecology as well as geography in your work. No, uh, see, the, the story that we were talking about that at length uh, about Rosa Luxemburg and that our, our trying to make a work about, not about her, but through her, was an attempt to, actually an attempt to understand geography in the present, in a sense that what would this geography be? Because it's a geography that you produce, you create, as much as you are given. So this, this tussle to produce an, a geography, of, uh, like the work was an attempt not to produce any, just an imaginary geography, but almost a physically linked geography where the, where the kind of movements of things and people are very volatilely connected and, and then disrupted and forgotten. So the, it's a kind of a very internal to the work, the idea of what, all the, even the surface of each day, the, where you see the planetary person, you saw those figures, the, the small photographs, those are from the Galton archives, where Galton did this massive kind of project to understand the average uh, prostitute, average Jew, average criminal, average. And what we found amazing <coughs> was that Galton ultimately faced a very strange paradox because he, in his attempt to find the average, he was superimposing one photograph and one photograph after. At the level of the 80, 90 photographs, he found that they have become extremely beautiful, almost like saint-like. So his, 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 his method produced an image that his concepts did, couldn't uh, come to term with. So this relationship between practices, geography, things, this is something that we are continuously trying to understand and create. That is one. And the ecology part is like the sea thing you saw, there's more salt in your tear. That is our tribute to the Baltic Sea because the Baltic Sea has salt which is much less than our tears, little less. So, so each tear that 
has more salt when you. The idea was that if Baltic Sea loses its salinity, uh, you will have a complete different uh, disruption of the ecology that we know of. Like herrings would go away completely. Things, even your Arctic tern, uh, Arctic tern may not, uh, because in Baltic Sea it up, does appear. It comes and lies down exhausted. It may not come there because the weather, con microclimate of the Baltic Sea would change. So we try to kind of th think this in relationship to what kind of way you can produce a extremely personal affect that you can draw. It is not out there. It has to move somewhere. But it has to move through you. So uh, this, uh, we can discuss it later because this is very complicated. And <laughs> I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to um, try to put together strands that were prompted both by your talk on uh, Kubler as well as on the uh, Rax Collective. Um, just to try to think what sort of art history might um, become about as a consequence of putting the art before the history. In other words, instead of having the framework <coughs> into which to um, pigeonhole all these things we call art, what if we started the other way around? And as, as I think Kubler and the collective seems to be uh, <coughs> proposing, what if we start with our reactions to the object without this framework? What sort of a history would it look like? And, you know, that's just spec speculating here that you'd have a series of different narratives and the narratives would um, be uh, not disconnected from one another. And it, there are tendencies, I suppose, in the contemporary situation that would uh, argue that this is probably the best way to go uh, with, rather than have, a, say, a universal art history or a global art history or a world art history, but then how would we be able to distinguish these narratives from the narratives we know from fiction and so, so how would we be able to you know, establish? And so I'm falling back for want of anything else <laughs> on um, Hayden White's wonderful term that uh, historical narratives have to have the odor of the real about them. They have to smell like the real. And I just wondered if that might or might not be a productive way to think about it. I'd like to, can I add something to this? And if it's and if it doesn't fit, then just you know we'll bracket it away. But I'd be very interested to know, um, um, Keith, if you think the if, if there's any way to conceptualize the 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 coincidence of interest in the global, the the periodization of interest in the global, the return, the period after the global, all these things on the one hand, and interest in prioritizing the encounter with the artwork on the other. That that whole group of interests which you've been developing um, is very, um, in my mind, ha has a different uh, trajectory, or it comes from a different place, and yet somehow they're together now. That seems very interesting to me, very puzzling. And thank you for that term, the order of the real. I think that's a really interesting thing to hold on to. I'm going to start out this by thinking back to a childhood memory that connects to Gandhara sculpture. Um, as a child, you, you're taken to the National Museum in Delhi, and it's school trips. And I recall very, very, being very struck. It's an almost an, a moment of epiphany that I was thinking about when I was listening to Isabel speak about looking at a Gandhara head of a young boy, which I then saved up money to buy a replica of. And that head, and still stands in my desk, it always said to me that nothing comes from one place. And it was, in a sense, a way of thinking about a place in the world. Trying to locate a place in the world is a real proposition. In a city like Delhi through the 70s and 80s, which seemed to be at the far periphery of the world, where nothing seemed to happen adequately enough. It was a very, very real existential question for any person growing up thinking about the world to find a real place in the world. And I think actually reading Kubler is very interesting because he talks about scale. He talks about the scale of lifetimes and then the arbitrariness of the century and then the scale of uh, you know, 
um, epochs and so on. And the other thing he talks about is, of course, scales of space. And obviously, trying to make sense of who you are means that you have to scale back in time and scale outward in space, because that's the only way you can draw a coordinate of your latitudes and longitudes that locate you where you are. This exercise, which is to, to, to draw a real map, has to proceed on completely imaginary wheels, because we cannot imagine the whole world in our heads. Uh, we cannot comp apprehend the whole world in our heads. We can only imagine it. We cannot apprehend the, den the, the depth of time that takes us back to, to Gandhar. We can only imagine it. But it somehow is necessary in a real sense for me to know where I am and when I am today. In order to do that, I have to do this other operation. And I think that the question of a global art history is, is both, an, both a question of constructing a body of evidences that, that propose that that global art history is a real object. But at the same time, it's, it's an exercise in the imagination because it can't be, uh, you can't string those evidences together except through imaginative leaps. I don't know if that, and that's also by way of uh, responding to your question about speculation. Where does the speculation end? Um, I don't think it ends, but I think it provisionally ends at the, at, at the acceptance of the fact that without being able to speculate across a large distance, we will not be able to identify proximate realities. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we, you have to imagine the, the star you can't see in order to map the mile that you want to walk. Something like that. One uh, thing about the order of the real. Uh, last 10, 15 years, we have been trying to understand the order of the real in a fundamental way. And initially, last four, like early part, we tried it. We were in this whole very powerful essay by Deepesh Chakravarti, the provincializing Europe, this capital one, capital two, when this kind of powerful image of the waiting room of modernity. Now, I think for the first few years, we tried grappling the order of the real through the idea of the waiting room of modernity, and I think it didn't work for us in a sense that it just could not give us the range of things and people, desires, intensities that surrounded us and, was, and the trajectories and genealogies were so tantalizingly, uh, tantalizingly close and yet very difficult to comprehend that the waiting room didn't allow for us an entry into the order of the real. So the con I think concepts also block us in some way to enter that order of the real in that sense. And I think last five, six years, uh, we have tried our own investigation, uh, trying to build our own co concept, where laughter is an important part to generate the movement of the order. You know, the movement of the entry into the real is through a sense of laughter, a sense of, a sense of disbalance, you know? uh, like the, the brilliant Paul Key painting of the tightrope. Uh, 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 one of the great uh, return of the repressed is the man walking between the twin tower. You must have all seen, man on wire. It returns back into our memory as a field after 40 years. You know, it happens in 1972. That that sense of that return, that that order, conceptually through different ways. That I think we all we try. You know, that's that's our practice in that sense. So it's a battle to find the order in not sense take it for granted. I just had one question to Isabel. Uh, can I ask? It, like you, you, you covered a huge. Isabel, Isabel. Yeah. you covered a very wide back, uh, range, almost 900, 900 years, huh? 780, and the last image is 780. But do you think that you, you, the very important category you use is the resistance to the hegemonic, the, the the Greek? Do you think a category like resistance can hold us? in 700 years to explain 700 years. It, it's, in a strange way, it looks like the, the master image of the Greek holds itself as a very strong image and looks like for 700 years there is some resistance to it. The word, does the word conceptually resistance can play that field, can, can be operative at that long a field? Just as a curiosity, because I think it will be very difficult to make it operate at that scale of time. 
I'm not sure that I'm thinking in terms of resistance. Is that what you were asking? Mm -hmm. Well, these are all difficult questions because, as you were saying, it's a very um, it's a very broad it's, uh, it's a very broad structure and and way of looking at the situation that I was describing, and I'm not sure that any of the uh, uh, frameworks and concepts that I apply today uh, do in fact hold. I mean, uh, I think my talk was extremely open-ended, and I made it clear that while I respect, especially Stanley Abbe's. Um, approach, and I think he really has a sort of definite um, uh, attitude towards uh, these major questions. I, I, I can't really think in terms of resistance. There's too many. There are too many ways of thinking about it, about uh, the interactive dynamics, and there are too many objects that indicate we don't really know whether it's copying, whether it is posturing, whether it is uh, being aware or whether it is being not aware of what is going on. There are so many, as I call them reflective processes and identificatory processes and acts of admiration and devotion and acts of rejection. I'm not really sure what it all means. It's entirely hypothetical. But the point is that, the point I think that Stanley Abbey is trying to make is there is no truth as far as Gandhara is concerned and there will never be. Uh, so how can I go on? And after reading his chapter in this one book, um, The Curators of the Buddha, I think, I mean, my reaction was, I can either stop now, because he really has said the most profound things that I've ever read about Gandhara, or I can somehow go on. And my meek response today, and ever since I read this uh, chapter, was, or is, that I'm trying to look at a completely different question that hasn't been raised before, which is the question of gender. And um, then I reread, after I thought about gender, I reread the chapter a couple of times, Stanley Abbe's chapter uh, in the book, uh, monograph, uh, Curators of the Buddha. And I, I found this one sentence where he says, where Stanley Abbe says, my whole uh, work here really hinges on the, uh, on the point that, on his conviction that Western scholarship has always been and will continue to be invested in the idea that uh, the non-West needs to be injected by Western blood, as it were, in order, to, in order to produce, in order to be significant. If you don't feel that way, or if you don't think that you are coming from this historical position, then a lot of things don't work. But it's, of course, I'm always in, in that framework already, which is entirely the case. So I use Stanley Abe as um, uh, the only truly meaningful uh, point of reference, as far as I'm concerned, because he's really able to um, uh, speak to all the various positions while I think also saying the most definite and, and historically well-researched uh, providing the most uh, well-researched information as far as Skandata is concerned. Yeah, just briefly about that, and then we have uh, other questions. Mm -hmm. But so the, the reason I was asking that as, as you know, one of the themes about moving beyond other kinds of constructions, in this case, transnationality and transculturalism and so on, is because once you get to the Stan Abe position, you're finished. And that means also that the concepts you've been looking at to pursue astronomy metaphors have now been occluded. Where are they now? Right? They've suddenly disappeared, and you have a smaller uh, field, a very sharply defined field. So there's something strange happening there at the edges of that discourse, which is one of our main subjects here, I would think. So. Um, other questions? Any raising hands? No. Yeah? No, I'm Krista Kodras from Estonia. So uh, it is uh, actually not a question, uh, more like a commentary about the reception of, of, um, of uh, Kubler's uh, book. And uh, I think that it is um, not a surprise, uh, not, not surprise, this us that uh, one of the uh, people, uh, art historian I know, um, uh, his name is Jan Bielostotsky, and I think the German-speaking people know him. He was a Renaissance scholar and a Polish Renaissance scholar. And he addressed uh, the, the, the book of, um, of uh, Kubler in, I think, in late 80s, and uh, in the 
in, in the book uh, of articles called uh, Stil und Epoche. And um, why it is not surprising, uh, therefore, that he also tried to find a new model to explain why the, um, also the peripheral countries have art histories and why they are still to be valued as, as, as such. So he also com makes comments about this uh, um, diachronical art histories. So, uh, and um, the second part of the commentary is that, um, that, um, that uh, it um, maybe forces us to think uh, again and again about how we apply theories and also how we revisit theories that have been written uh, once upon a time. And, and I think this is very interesting how we really pick up the the, the concepts, because I, as, uh, as far as I, I remember <laughs> Kubler's book, it is, uh, for me at least, a totally modernistic book and, and very, very um, having these uh, ambitions of universe, universality. And how now you, as a young scholar, are picking up the concepts that suit your theory, and this is the theory of equal art histories of uh, to be written in contemporary world. So that's what's my comment. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Or because of the reception in Poland? Yeah. We talked about that Actually, this not, morning. Not, uh, I would like to uh, give a commentary about the reception of Kubler in Hungary, not in Poland, in Hungary. Oh, yeah. mm, never mind. And uh, it was exactly the opposite what Krista proposed because it became, it was translated quite soon and it was considered as a cult book, absolutely a cult book. And it has two reasons, it had two reasons. One of them was that uh, every, uh, a lot of people were, were fed up with the binary structure of official art history, official art, and oppositional art history and art. And this oppositional part embraced this Western modernism because they, would, they were eager to, to claim their connection to the Western modernism. So, and that was the reason this binary construction that Western modernism became very much fossilized in Hungary, even survived when it was deconstructed in the West. It was still very much alive in Hungary. So everyone who was fed up with this binary construction found an absolutely great tool to, to get rid of, of this structure. And the other reason was that uh, it was a cult book, that it gave a tool for that too, that, uh, that everyone was fed up with being a, a younger sister, a younger brother of the Western modernism, just a clumsy one, a belated one, a, a second-hand imitation kind of stuff. And Kubler gave a very good tool to find a place within this uh, situation. Well, thank you. It's so interesting to think about all the di different receptions that Kubler had in different contexts. That's again what I was talking about, the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous. So, yeah, that's basically it. You have to, to look at the contexts and what Kubler meant in a certain situation. I mean, I, I did a, a post-colonial reading of it, and of course, it's a very specific approach to Kubla. Other questions? So, I was so interested the moment, in fact, um, Isabel, that I read your abstract for the conference uh, that uh, all of a sudden transgender uh, which um, some might say the trans in transgender is the trans and trans historical, and trans historical is the evil enemy. Uh, and so here, um, and you know, I'm, I'm wearing a tie, so I have certain investments in mm -hmm. the possibilities of thinking the trans. Uh, uh, and uh, clearly I'm not disinterested, uh, so I've been bidding that. And I'm wondering about the gesture, 
to insist that the global, whatever its compassability or incompassibility, has to be reformatted and shaped to the perimeters of a discipline whose edges we claim to know. And we also claim to know somehow when you're at that edge and when you fall off it. And that that falling off the edge happens at the moment of the introduction of a term such as transgender, which seems to be impossible to think because somehow the Stan Abe position, whatever that is, because we haven't specified it here, I, we, it's been specified elsewhere, um, is somehow one of those signposts on the road off the map. Um, and further, I'm also wondering, is transiting out of art history as we know it, I mean, I think that that was the prompt of an exploded art history, is transiting out of it as we know it necessarily a dead end or can it be multiple joy rides? Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm wondering about what makes possible a different understanding of yet another global turn, uh, let's keep turning the global, that would admit asking additional questions, um, raising additional problematizations that would allow us to think with flamingos that turn further shades of red um, and think with the possibilities of something that we would mark by um, a sign like um, the term transgender. And I would love to hear your responses about um, what other versions of the global we might imagine that could actually uh, think with uh, differences, uh, those cherished differences between species, the insistence on uh, boundaries between human and animal that would insist on boundaries between male and female. Um, there's a reason arguably why the term genre, uh, in, in French anyway, and I apologize, it's one of the languages I think with, um, you know, is also the gender that I, it seems to me that these are linked, that is that the forms that we think things take uh, can um, determine the outcomes, but I'm hoping not. So I, I, I'd love to hear uh, you, any of the participants to uh, respond to a question of um, how thinking the global might actually um, work with thinking these other uh, possibilities. Um, the term transgender is clearly um, a difficult one, and I wasn't really sure whether I should introduce it in this manner, because it's very um, unspecified, as you must have noticed. Uh, what I had originally planned to talk about was the fact that, um, well, there are two motions going on. There's the opening of the, or the, not even the opening, there's this interplay of different gender orders, as I call them, and apparently a, an, an availability of different options and iconographies and conventions that were being taken advantage of in a very interesting and productive manner. At the same time, while this was going on, I think something else hardened, which was actually the Buddha image itself, in the sense that, and I uh, wasn't really sure if I should bring this up, but I think it, it uh, is the other side of the uh, non-binary nature of, of, of gender at that time, uh, which is the fact that the Buddha image became increasingly elaborately cloaked, as I mentioned to you. Um, and he is, as a standing figure, he is always the, um, he is a male figure, he's always a male figure. And according to the 32 characteristics of an enlightened being or a, a wise person, a Mahapurusha, he is also um, not showing any genitals. He does not showing external genitals, as was, for example, very much the case with the yaksha images, uh, the way Ananda Kumariswamy uh, argued earlier on. Um, so, in the case of the Buddha, uh, these dynamics, I think, led to the fact that he became a, an early global icon of some sort, where people imagined him without his external genitals, which, according to these um, uh, uh, iconographic characteristics are retracted inside the Buddha's body. And the reason why he is heavily cloaked, I think, must have to do with the fact that everybody else can show off what they have, but not the Buddha. 
And that was very important. That was, from what I have found out, really the only place, the only thing that everybody seemed to be clear about, he cannot be shown other than with retracted genitals, which I think is a really profound um, um, insight or fact, whatever you might, might want to call it, and that everything else that so loosely occurred around him is, is connected to the fact that he, as, a, as an enlightened being, as an early global icon that made, must have made his impression on thousands of monks and travelers and pilgrims, was the person who was poor, um, non-sexual, and um, begging, basically. Uh, that, that iconographic combination was everybody was firm on, and that's what kind of interests me, whereas everything else, as far as gender is concerned, was loosely, apparently, quite loosely and interactively uh, evolving, and they were codependent in some way. Um, but I wasn't really ready to, to talk about uh, the, um, uh, the phallic symbolism in, in that period, but I think it really needs to be talked about because it, isn't, it hasn't been mentioned yet. So going back to Stanley Abbe, I think, um, I think my point is, and thank you for bringing this up because it's really hard for myself to, for me to think this through on my own. Um, as soon as these questions come up, his framework somehow doesn't really hold anymore because what if it was not, that the Buddhist monks back then did not think about the origin of the Buddha image. Uh, the origin of the Buddha image may not even have been relevant since there are so many non-Buddhist images that we have never talked about, really. So um, um, how do I explain this? And who made these female images? Were those monks as well? Who was looking at these figures? And then what I didn't show today is the whole other side that was beautifully captured, or has been beautifully captured by a Japanese art dealer. He has published two books where he just photographed excavation sites by just looking at uh, different pieces of dust or metal, and he basically photographed things that we have never seen before, such as tiny figures that were um, possibly hand-molded or uh, uh, um, carved out by non-artisans, tiny childlike figures that also have all the characteristics of an enlightened being, which are Buddhist images or Buddha images. Well, we only think in terms of great artworks, like the last image that I showed, where I rhetorically asked, is it Antoninos Pius or Siddhartha? Now, that image you know, speaks to us as a masterpiece in a way. We, we, we automatically, we intuitively know something great appears in front of us. But all these other tiny, insignificant, um, never talked about figures also exist. And what, what to, how to think about those, and what do those mean? Who, who was doing, who was making these objects? Was it really Buddhist? We have time for just a few more questions, and maybe someone in the back, or students, or one more question, you say. But, and I'd like to stick to our main uh, subjects, which is the Buddhist genitals, or the headless corpse <laughs> of Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> Either one, right? One last question. This is more to uh, Kirsten about Kubler's um, notion, the shape of time. I don't know if I've understood you right, but you seem to be suggesting that um, his work has got a lot of implication for post-colonial studies. Uh, I understand in terms of uh, the way in which we can bring in distru you know, uh, discontinuity and um, where a lot of non-Western uh, cultures can be given a certain kind of visibility. <laughs> Is that what you mean? Because I don't know you, I, if I heard you right, but you said in passing that uh, so cultures without a textual tradition can also be understood. Is that what you were saying? That was one of the problems he, he was facing in his research. So that's why he kind of, I, I was asking myself, why did he came up with the shape of time? What was the, the starting point for it? And. Um, he, he talks about iconology and about the problems. Well, he's only talking all the time about all the um, um, art historical methods that he cannot use or that he rejects for his research interest. And um, I think that his um, idea of breaks and ruptures, because he says iconology is only interested in continuities, but he's interested in breaks and ruptures. And this notion of breaks and ruptures comes from his awareness of colonization. 
but and that's my interpretation. I don't know if it really was like that, but I can imagine that um, because he, he, he always uh, worked on the margins of art history, so he, he really had some problems with applying methods. Okay, I, I don't see what that has to do with Buddhist genitals, but it's okay. <laughs> So I think we have to stop. I'd like to thank the speakers, and I'll hand over to Aruna.